Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to our seminar today. My name is Giles Bristow. I'm Digital Support Manager for Antalis. And the seminar today is the do's and don'ts of colour management. And the next half hour is a really a snapshot of one of the seminars that we run in our Digital Academy in Leicestershire. We have a purpose-built digital academy where we have around about 25 different seminars we run on all aspects of digital printing and technology. Your host for the seminar today is Jan Edgecombe. Jan is uh, managing director of a company called Revolution Digital, who are a partner of Antalis in our digital academy, and he's a renowned color management expert. So I'm going to leave you in Jan's capable hands, and uh, if you stay for the duration of the seminar, there is an opportunity to win an x right uh, I1 it. color profiling device. Um, and we'll do a little draw at the end of the seminar. And of course, there'll be an opportunity to ask questions uh, of both myself and Jan. So please enjoy, and I look forward to speaking to you in around about 30 minutes time. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. It's uh, another almost full house. We were very busy yesterday. So that's, that's the reason for staying during the, uh, the next half an hour. One of you will walk away happy. The rest of you will walk away, hopefully, uh, happy. <laughs> so, OK. So it's... It, we're not going to cover everything in colour management in half an hour, but we're just going to have a, try and have a bit of fun in between and just cover some of the things that you kind of have to try and make you think about it. So, how many people know how many Coca-Cola Reds there are? How many Coca-Cola Reds? At the back? No, but it's, there's more than one. So there's a Coca-Cola Red on a brown carton. There's a Coca-Cola red on a can. There's a Coca-Cola red on an outer. Because what you're looking at is, not, is the ability to print the best you can for the Coca-Cola red on different substrates. So this happens with Cadbury's uh, and various other large brands. You're not going to have just one color that you've, you're going to have to absolutely hit every single time. So a lot of people spend a lot of time and a lot of money uh, trying to maintain Coca-Cola red in different places around the world. So. If you guys get confronted with working with a big brand, you've got to do the same thing. But you will have something to work towards and uh, hopefully achieve it. So what happens if you don't care about colour? Uh, well, we've got a couple of examples of a couple of local uh, businesses that, based in Leicester. We're, we're from Leicestershire. Uh, this was a, a nice exhibition job, so similar to what's going on here today. Eight panels were delivered to the exhibition, and someone went over one of the panels with a forklift truck. And he thinks, to himself, well, that's not a problem, we'll just print another one. So they went back to the shop, they printed another one, they brought the exhibition panel, and surprise, surprise, the colour was different. So in between making the exhibition panels, delivering the exhibition panels, and putting them up, they'd had a guy come and fix the machine. I say fix the machine. They changed the print head, changed the characteristics of the printer, destroyed any colour management or colour calibration that they had, and they didn't run it with colour calibration in mind in the first place. On top of which, the guy who actually did the printing wasn't there that day. So you can guess it, they had to print all eight panels again. Bit of a disaster, but it's not untypical. So if you, if you control the way your printer behaves, if you calibrate your printer on a regular basis and you have some kind of management, this is the word we're trying to get across is colour management, it's really more to do with management, the colour takes care of itself if you manage it, then off you go and you're happy and you'll save some money. Another one, a uh, sign company that we know in Leicester, got a really nice job working for a big brand, but through an agency. So the agency had put out work to litho printers, to textile printers, all these guys were working to a nice standard, they produced a beautiful job. Unfortunately, the sign guy came in and went, wow, what do you think of that? It's really nice and bright and cheerful. Completely the wrong color. Because he hadn't controlled his printer and worked towards the standard that everybody else was using. So you can stand out as a sign maker, but for completely the wrong reasons. Is anyone cold? I'm afraid, you know, we've been, I've been cold all morning, so I'm gonna shiver a little bit. So lighting, um, this is another, nasty subject. Again, we're going to relate it to um, uh, one of the seminars we did. We had, a, we had a, a point of sale printing business come to one of our colour seminars and he was doing a lot of work for Next, so obviously another Leicestershire based company. We're plugging Leicester today, apart from the football, which is not worth plugging unless they really make a good comeback. Um, 
so th this very nice POS company produced these produced and distributed a lot of work that went on the end of an aisle for a load of sweaters. So they're nice chamomile sweater. It's about a 40 quid sweaters. Uh, and next had a load of people walking in and saying, I want to buy that green sweater. Uh, we're only selling grey ones. What do you mean? The green one that's on the POS thing at the end of the, on the end of the aisle. So, you know, obviously the balloon went up because they weren't selling any green sweaters. And uh, rang up the company. Now, they produced their prints in... Does everybody know what a D50 lighting condition is? Put your hands up. Only two, three, four, five. Okay, thank you at the back because they're from Antalus. They, they should know what D50 is. Um, so they produced their job. D50 lighting condition, nice grey print. Put it into the lighting condition of the store. It went from grey to green. A bit of a disaster. So does everybody understand what that is? Does anyone heard of metamerism? Yeah, okay, so one, one, maybe two. A couple of nods at the front. The people at the front are going to have a very exciting moment because you're going to actually see what metamerism is. So, lighting condition. So we've got a little booth here. Um, and Panto make a very nice, uh, nice little product. So if you guys can gather around, you'll have to tell them, people at the back, how it works. Can you, can you come to the front? You three at the end there, you can participate. Come, come around. So you are nearly at the front, but if you stand up, it looks, looks more interesting. If you gather around that side a bit. <laughs> Just shuff, shuffle yourselves over there so we, they can still see at the back. When we have a smaller group, you can all gather around, but I'm afraid you, they'll just have to explain what's going on. I'll try and make it obvious. So if you've got a Pantone product, uh, which is the Pantone lighting indicator, this will tell you what your lighting condition is, if you conform to D65 or D50. So in this, these conditions, actually the LED lights in here are quite good. Can everybody see a, a nice green sticker? Okay, so if I change it to lighting condition D65, that's quite close to what we're doing at the moment. So if you look in here, it's still a, still a nice green sticker. Yep. Okay, everyone happy with that? Yep. Still see it at the back, just about? Okay, so if we go to store lighting, oops, oh, yeah. everybody see that? Just about, so store lighting, we've got two different colors out here, one color. So it's, it's just like Paul Daniels, but without the blonde wig. Okay. So you're convinced lighting really does matter. So if you're printing stuff, make sure you understand the lighting condition that you're going to be putting the thing into. Okay. You may now sit down. Thank you. If you can wave to the people at the back, you know, they, they, they should be happy. Okay. So it's a big, big long word and I can't spell it, but it's called metamerism. It's the effect that putting ink on paper in different lights that can be affected by different lighting light sources. So it's, 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 come to the course and we'll go into it in a bit more detail. There you go, that's a bit of a plug. So the next contentious item, how many people print CMYK Litho? Any hands? CMYK Digital. How many of you actually get given colours to print with CMYK numbers on? They say, my brand is, and then they give you a CMYK value. At least a few, yeah? Have you understood that that's kind of impossible? Good. So we, this is getting rarer, but a lot of people try to say, this is my brand identity, and I want you to print these particular... And sometimes they'll give you RGB values as well, which is even worse, because they work on a website, and they don't understand that RGB, CMYK, is a bit different. So just to give you another small anecdote, we went to a very large government organisation, and they had been given by a design agency a corporate identity, very nice corporate identity, and everything was in CMYK or RGB. And they were handing this thing out. They then printed it on, on, a, on a Xerox machine, and depending on which Xerox machine, they got different values because one was set up with American standards, one was set up with UK standards, so they had two different corporate identities. And I said, well, we prefer that one. Didn't measure anything, but they'd hand that out to all of their suppliers and say, that's the corporate identity we'd like you to hit. So little Joe Bloggs printer went, mm, that's the CMYK values, I'll print them. This guy had a large format printer, that's my CMYK values, I'll print them. Can you imagine what happened? Everything came back, correct CMYK values for toner, for inkjet, for whatever other process they were doing, but the colour was completely different on every single job. They said, we can't get our suppliers to do it properly. So 
the big no-no is using CMYK as a reference for anything because the, the value of cyan on an inkjet printer between Epson, Muto, Roland, Mimaki, or whatever litho ink you buy from Sun Chemical or whoever, that value does not relate to the colour you're going to end up mixing together to make it work. So it's really, really important you just use some other method. Uh, and the method is obviously, uh, that's just a little example, reasonably clear. The method is to use some kind of measurement or spot colour within your file. So use a lab value that you can measure or use a Pantone colour that you can measure. So the whole idea is measuring stuff. And, and tell a customer who comes to you and says, this is my corporate identity. And if they give you CMYK, they say, well, go away and do it again. <laughs> or we'll measure it for you off that fag packet you've just given me. And we will put that data into our software and we will make you a corporate identity and charge them an extra 150 quid. You know, why not? So use Pantones. They're independent of whichever printing system you're going to use. Getting every single Pantone to match on every single device, that's where the color management bit comes in. Because large format tends to be a slightly wider color gamut than standard litho. And you will get color shifts depending on the, the rip you're using and, and how you kind of pull all the things together. Has everyone heard of Fogra 39? Oh, look at that. How many people are actually accredited to ISO 12647? Ooh, two. So they should be doing this, really, because they know what they're doing. You're totally sorted. Why are you here, Mr. Heidelberg? <laughs> yes, yeah, so everyone should throw, throw stuff at Mr. Heidelberg in the middle there. <laughs> Trying to achieve when you print it. So you want the RIP to do the same thing. So you don't want the RIP converting stuff. It's making sure you've got a system that controls the colour. The colour management bit is, 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 you know, it's smoke and mirrors. Everyone comes up and says, oh, colour management, it, you know. We'll charge you 1,500 quid and we'll make your colour management work. What you really need is someone to actually take charge of what do I need to do to make the colour on my devices the same on everything and then spend a bit of money and then manage it. So calibrate or profile. How many people have got a digital, off, a digital a small format press? You know, like a Xerox or a Ricoh or other brands are available. Yep. Um, how many of you have got a little i1 that came with it? How many can remember seeing a little box buried under the... Yeah? How many people take it out and calibrate their... This is really sad. At least yesterday we had three. God. <laughs> or someone put the hand up and pretend, you know. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. When they gave you this, this very expensive printer that you're spending a lot of money on, they gave you a small i1 device that sits next to the RIP and you're supposed to be calibrating your printer on a daily basis. And if you do it on a daily basis, then you will, you, even, I mean, we've got customers who take this seriously and they will measure their machine three times a day because in the morning, the paper's just getting warm. In the, it, by, mi, by the afternoon, the room's warmed up, the moisture content has changed, you've got bodies running around the building and they will literally calibrate the machine as they're going along. In fact, Xerox have even built it in now to calibrate it as you're going along. Why is, why is that built in? Because that technology needs it. So if you're thinking of Antalis, do not take that massive pallet of paper straight off the back of a wagon that's been driving to you and is minus five degrees and shove it into your Xerox because it will not print very well. Uh, you know, I let it acclimatize and, 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 the, and the rest of it. So calibration is a massive part of what you can do to maintain the color of your printer. The profile sits on top of it. So you've got a profile, but someone made a calibration on the printer to get to the profile. It doesn't fix broken print heads or knackered drums or anything like that. It, you, you've got to kind of think of it as a, the little link between a good working printer and something that's drifted out of calibration. and, and that calibration will come back in, and that's why Xerox and a few other companies are building it into those sorts of devices, and why um, you should take it out of the little box and have a play with it. You can also put spot colors into your rip. The funniest thing we get is going around to a company, um, we went around to a very large um, municipal business that's run fairly local to us. I said, where's your I1? You've got, you've got two brand new Ricos in there really nice machines, they, they supplied you an I1. 
it took them 25 minutes to find the box with all the bits in because it had been buried. So the thing that measures spot colours that is really, really useful, they couldn't find all the, all the accessories for the I-1 because it, it was covered in dust under a pile of other stuff. So do, this is coming back to what I said earlier, just as a quick reminder, do set up your Adobe applications, shift control K, shift command K, choose the one I've got on there is preserve embedded profiles, preserve, 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 and ask, ask, ask. So there's a little button on there that says ask. The trick behind that is if you're opening a file from a customer, it'll pop up if it's not Adobe RGB 1998 or Fogger 39 or the ISO or whichever settings you've decided to use. So if it's not those settings, it's going to tell you that file needs to be looked at. But then you've got to remember if you've got, um, if you're doing it in Bridge, you can see what it looks like. If you open it, this is the confusing question. When you open this file and Adobe says to you, um, this is not, do you want to convert it? Do you want to leave it alone? Do you want to use the embedded profile? Whatever you do, do not convert anything. Just leave it alone and open it. And then you can see what it looks like. Because what you don't want to do is change it before you've seen it. So it's one of those sort of catch-22s. If you convert it to your new profile, you haven't seen what it looked like originally. And the whole idea of profiling is to maintain the appearance of everything all the way through the whole process. It's not really a big secret. That's all you're trying to do. The guy designed it. Maintain that appearance. You've got to try and do what they designed. But sometimes you might have to go back to the customer and say, can you do it properly this time? That's a lot of the problem we have. Right, OK. So this is the uh, human interactive bit. Now, this is the bit I want on camera with you all nodding. But I don't know whether it'll work. I've, I've asked him to see if he can do it. But you're gonna, there's a lot of nodding involved in this. Now, the other thing is, if anyone sees red dots, you need to go and talk to uh, your doctor. I'm um, quite serious about that. Focus on the one on the right-hand side. Find a little spot, and then look top left, bottom right. Just move around. Can you see black dots running around in front of your eyes? They're sort of chasing you around as you're moving around, yeah? Bit of nodding. Right at the back, is it working for you too? Good. OK, the one on the left-hand side, you have to relax on this one. So this is a bit more of a zen moment. So you just, just, just gently relax. Look at the bit in the middle. Then look at the bit on the outside of it. And then look at the bit in the middle. And is it sort of all sort of wafting about, moving around? Yeah? Even, yeah, yeah. If you've had a hard night, it probably won't. But you've got it all wafting about. OK, so none of that is on screen. There's no video involved. That's all totally inside your brain. Your eyes aren't doing anything, but your brain is. OK? But we did have somebody have black spot, uh, instead of black spots, they had red spots, which is a little bit worrying. <laughs> so this one, similar idea, this is the, bit, this is the, this is the, uh, the money shot, OK? Stare at the tiny little black dot. And I want you to really focus on the little black dot. OK. Now you've got to nod backwards and forwards, like a really give it a good nod, OK? Nice and back, just relax, and backwards and forwards. There you go. I'm so glad we got this on video. OK, did you see it? Did everyone see that? You're all getting the old uh, twisty thing going on? Again, nothing's moving on the screen. It's all totally inside your brain. Well, and just to finish you off, my glamorous assistant will now pass you some stuff. So the trick on this one is, do you believe that square A and square B are different? It's obviously a trick question, but is it worth a quid? Would you bet me a quid that square A and square B are different? You know you wouldn't. Come on, you know you wouldn't. So is everyone getting square A and square B are different, yeah? Different colour. Not the lettering, the, the actual squares. Some ladies will look at it and, because they're slightly better at this, they might say, oh no, they're exactly the same. Anyone going to argue? Are they all different? You've got, you've, you see the same. You just, it's just rubbish printing on off. Oh. Okay, so. But general consensus, A and B is different, yeah? Square A, square B is different. And you'd 
Would you put a quid on it? Ooh. Well, of course you've seen it before. Well, we know, we know this is a trick question. Now my glamorous assistant will just help you out with this. So, take it home, rip your kids off. Get your pocket money back. What do you reckon? Are square A and B different? Have we left you astonished? Yes? No? A bit more nodding, please. Come on. Okay, good. So, thank you for your time. We're going to have a few questions before we hand out the... Um, in fact, the person who wins has to definitely ask a question, just to make it up for everyone else. So, ladies and gentlemen, do we have any questions for Jan at all? Anybody like to ask any questions at all? No takers, all staying silent? Yeah. Lady here. Am I on? Yes. Jan, thank you for that. Very interesting presentation. You did say, there was one point where you said, um, you know, so, so do all this and, and, and it'll cost you a little bit of money. So all of these tips that you've been given, yes. uh, you know, what, what is the cost implications? Is, you know, Depends who you work with. <laughs> um, if, if you work with Antalis, it'll cost you a bit less money, obviously. But the idea behind it is to try and, what we're trying to do is, is get people educated that with, with a few simple things and a little bit of management as opposed to thinking, I've got to get loads of consultants in and do loads of things. You, you know, and with a bit of advice and help from Antalis, obviously, um, you can get a lot of stuff linked together. You may have to dust off an I1. You may have to come for some training on how to use it. Um, you know, you may, you may have to have someone come and actually show you how to use it. So just don't be afraid of it. It's not, this is not a black art. It's just something that you can, you can just work towards. I mean, you see the bit on the back that says expert. That's because I've cocked it up many, many, many more times than you have. So I now am an expert because I've made all the mistakes that you're probably doing at the minute. So it's just, you know, focus on, is it a problem? For some of you, it's not going to be a problem. Um, for some of you, this might be a massive problem, especially when everybody's doing, trying to do everything. They're trying to do small format stuff, large format stuff, and stuff, anything in between. And trying to get everything to match with all the different substrates and get consistent output is, is a, a massive challenge at the moment for businesses. Anybody else? Anyone at the back? Oh, well, uh -huh. Hi, uh, we have a uh, wide format eco solvent and aqueous. We have um, small format digital presses, um, different makes and models, Konica, um, Rico, yep. etc. So you're saying with, that with this device, we can literally regulate the colour across the board. So for, for an event, for an open day, we'll produce pop-up banners, we'll produce contravision panels, and we'll produce leaflets and, and, and brochures. It, it's not the, the device is just a means to an end. The device actually allows you to measure what you're doing and try to what you're trying to do is, is coordinate the, the colour. So if, you, if, you, if everybody is aiming at the same standard, so if you're doing small format, then Xerox is going to allow you to do isocoated V2 or Fogger 39, more, you know, which is more or less the same thing. If you're then, your large format printer is printing to the same standard and you can measure whether it is, then you, you, you can make print on a large format device that matches print on a small format device. So it's, it's, it's not, the, the device doesn't fix anything. The device just allows you to measure it. So it's, it's putting all those things together and trying to learn how to. That's, that's the trick. And if you, use, you know, if you come to a, the academy and you engage with Antalis in terms of um, you know, talking to, to, to the guys about the problems you've got, we'll try and help solve the problems. But it may cost you money, but hopefully we're going to show you that it's going to save you money in the long run. Anything else? Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? Or well, we're going to get to the exciting bit. The uh, okay. prize winner is... Before we do that, um, can I just say thank you for attending today's seminar. If you'd like to learn more about the Digital Academy or colour management, please do come and talk to myself or Jan afterwards. Imagine. And of course, everything that Antalis does in terms of goods and services is illustrated on our stand, which is just a short uh, hop from this theatre across the way there. Otherwise, um, I'm going to ask uh, Tanya from Print Week to uh, draw a number out of the, uh, the glass bowl there. Okay, and we have... And the winner is... Number 54. Do we have 54? Excellent. We have a gentleman at the front.
Okay. It's not fixed, honestly. It's not fixed at all. So, while this gentleman gets his prize, can I say thank you very much indeed for attending, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day at Print Week. Thank you very much. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, even, even nicer. Thank you.